Welcome everybody to the fifth iteration of Shore Cloud Cyber Threat Briefing. Uh, so my name is Craig Moore. So uh, I look after Shore Cloud's risk advisory practice, uh, and I'm joined by Aaron, uh, one of our uh, principal security consultants. So uh, we're going to uh, look at sort of what's going on in the news today. Um, I think uh, you know we focused a few of our previous sessions on specific activities. Um, this time round, I, I think, as I say, we're, we're going to look at what's actually going on. So uh, I guess the the first thing is uh, Aaron, what What's notable? Um, what what do we what have we seen uh, recently in the news that that's that's worth having a chat about? So there's been lots happening. Um, if we exclude ransomware, which obviously takes a a large chunk of the news headlines, um, there's been a fairly high profile set of issues in Azure's open management infra framework. Uh, we can discuss those a little bit further, but. That allow remote takeover and privilege escalation on Linux VMs in Azure. Um, and then at the tail end of last month, there was a really great demonstration of uh, insider threat where a woman who'd just been fired caused a huge amount of damage internally to the company by deleting loads of files. Okay, so I, I did actually see the OMI one. So from my perspective, uh, I, I guess, firstly, I, I wasn't really aware that, that people were using uh, Unix through Microsoft. Seems like a, a bit of a counterproductive thing, but I, I guess, you know, the world's moved on a lot since uh, since I worked on a Microsoft operating system. So what, what's the fundamentals there? What, um, you know, what, what, was, the, what was the issue? Uh, so essentially all uh, Unix VMs, Linux VMs that were set up through Azure had a management framework um, installed on them that was separate from what would be present in the, the standard image of those, those operating systems. Um, the, the implementation itself had a couple of vulnerabilities um, whereby it would, if, it, if the authentication token was removed, the service would still respond, but instead of operating in a low user context or declining to, to process the request, it would process the request as root. Uh, so any unauthenticated user in the worst implementation uh, basically allowed a unauthenticated remote attacker to run code with full, full privileges on, on your endpoint. Nice. So from, from that perspective, I guess what's the... Uh... You know, what's the basis here? What what are people um, what are people missing? What what's the what's the root cause of this? So, like we discussed last week about the shared responsibility model, it's a it's an interesting one because it only affects uh, virtual machines that are deployed by users. Uh, so that you your everything up to the the kind of virtual machine hardware is managed by Azure, and everything above that is managed by end users. The challenge here is that Azure, we're essentially injecting an additional software into the operating system that people weren't necessarily aware about, and it wasn't automatically patching. So when a vulnerability was identified in it, users either didn't know it was installed on their hosts or had no mechanism to, to kind of automatically update it. Microsoft's now given guidance on how to do that, but it's still a manual process that you need to do. And if you have an estate that has maybe 20,000 virtual machines in the cloud, if you're a, if you're a large company, that can be obviously a significant challenge to try and implement manual update tasks across your whole estate. So it's interesting as to who's to blame. Obviously, following the kind of shared responsibility model, everything within the OS is for that for that style of host is is the end user's responsibility. But we have a scenario where Microsoft were essentially injecting a different additional software that the user had no idea was there. And therefore, is unlikely to be making sure it's up to date if they didn't know it was there to start with. Yeah, that's really interesting. I guess from from a, a general perspective, then obviously in compliance, we'd be looking at these types of things. You know, the regular kind of vulnerability identification, analysis, patching. You know, how how would that have differed? You know, it, you mentioned obviously that people wouldn't have even known it was there. You know, would it have been visible to them? So it would have been visible if somebody was to kind of investigate into the OS. But I guess if you if you'd completed it in your local development environment, you used a, a standard Ubuntu image, for example, and you then replicated the exact same thing in the cloud, there would be one different factor is that this additional agent has been added. 
So it, it, it presents this challenge that you can't monitor it for patch levels. You can't ensure that there's no, the, you can't ensure that there's, you're like following feeds to see that there's new patches available if you didn't know it was there in the first place. The only way you'd know is if you conducted a kind of thorough baselining of the it like deployment in Azure compared to your employment, your deployment that was local. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, from a shared responsibility perspective. Obviously, I guess we put a lot of trust in third parties like you know cloud providers to to actually be managing these things on our behalf in a in a safe and secure way. And um, uh, you know, particularly if a user can't see that those are there, or an administrator, you know, it begs the question whether you know compliance is 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 truly valuable. And you know, there's a lot of discussion around continuous compliance and around looking at you know technologies that give you that assurance that things are you know staying safe and secure if if those fundamental things can be bypassed by you know third parties that that, that we're there to, to trust so to speak you know where, where does that leave us you know is is there um you know a question around compliance um and and whether you know we can keep things safe and secure in the cloud in in a, in our control as well yeah i think it brings you back to the the kind of old saying of trust but verify obviously you have to put a reasonable amount of trust in in cloud providers because they're providing so much of the kind of stack but you need to do everything within your power that's reasonable to to validate that a they're doing what you think they're doing and try and identify these kind of deviations from what you'd expect yeah i think um you know we've had a question as well um in the chat around um you know whether Compliance is given organisations, uh, you know, this full sense of security. Um, I guess that's a really difficult one, really, because you, you've got the trust factor, you've got the shared responsibilities, you've got obviously a, a level of trust and, and resilience that you put in the cloud provider um, itself. But you know, I think you just pulled out there. That there's always that verification. Um, I guess the the complexity comes if you don't know it's there. How how do you know that you're you know, responsible for it or, or that you should be looking for that as well. So I'm going to guess this didn't have a nice little portlet in a dashboard that kind of pointed you um, to, to alarm bells going off either. You know, this this I imagine was found through, you know, uh, somebody digging a little bit deeper than they would normally um, rather than, you know, it kind of being brought to the attention by by the cloud provider. Is, is that fair? Yeah, I think from my understanding, it also didn't show in any of the kind of cloud compliance dashboards that, that you can get. I mean, across all cloud providers, you can get dashboards that will monitor uh, a large selection of things and will tell you that everything looks fine. Um, there's a, obviously a limit to the value that they can add if they don't have full visibility, and even more so if you haven't tailored them to your environment, because if it's not doing additional checks for your kind of additional implementation, all you're getting is kind of a baseline that doesn't take into account any of the complexities on top. Yeah, I think it's interesting because organizations are obviously being pushed to protect as much as they can. And, and obviously there's a big uh, push towards cloud environments for, you know, cost of cost of ownership and, you know, looking very much at that flexibility and scalability. But I guess it raises a question as to whether you can truly protect your assets in that type of environment when when these types of things happen. So, you know, one of the things that, that this always comes back to is the impact. Um, I mean, you've obviously highlighted what the potential impact could be if uh you know if if that's compromised or if it's used as part of a compromise but what what about some of the other aspects what about you know clients um getting sort of um repercussion from this um you know where they're seeking i, I don't know payouts on insurance policies or you know things things like that you know where would they stand if if it's not clearly defined whose responsibility that should be so i think that's a tough one i i, I don't think there's been any kind of demonstrated cases on the back of how an insurance would, would land in that case but obviously most insurance policies mandate things like minimum levels of patching. But if, if you don't know it exists because a, a third party provider has kind of injected it into your, into your host without your knowledge, it, it probably lands in a, an obscure area where the cloud provider will almost definitely maintain that it's your responsibility due to it being in your part of the shared responsibility model, but without any kind of knowledge of it being there or having or at least if you haven't extensively read the Azure documentation to make sure you know exactly what's happening in the in the background, which seems unlikely given all, all cloud providers are set up to be as user-friendly as possible to try and limit that kind of learning curve. So 
it's a tough one. I'm not sure where an insurer would land. I've, I've no doubt questions would be asked of the cloud provider, but I'm also sure that they would have all of the answers to hand and the kind of legal backing to say that it was in, in your responsibility area. Yeah, I always find it interesting because one of the key questions we're asked all the time in the consulting team is, is the true value of things like insurance policies to, to cover you know, deficits um, in, in cybersecurity. And you know, I, I think I've seen lots of examples of where insurance can be used as a good stopgap, but um, you know, equally, um, you know, we just had a question around cyber insurance. And you know, it's, it's times like these where I'm, I, I, I've struggled to see whether the value of an insurance policy would, would actually you know, prevail here, whether you're truly going to be covered by the policy or not. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not pro insurance policy or, or, or indeed I'm, I'm not against it. But from my perspective, I, I think I've seen um, more organisations struggle to get you know, some traction with claiming on insurance for, for things that they genuinely, uh, you know, either didn't know or, or didn't do particularly well, which for me is what an insurance policy is there to do. But it seems that there's lots of kind of what ifs and maybes. And, and as you just articulated, really, I guess, you know, the cloud providers would come back with quite a strong position as to why it would be your responsibility, which, you know, may leave you in a difficult position if you're, you know, being sort of encouraged to look at insurance and, and cyber insurance as well. Absolutely. So, uh, it, it's also a throw up between where you could also attribute those that kind of funding as well. There's there's other alternatives you could pay for kind of retainers for IR functions. Most most of those kind of retainers will allow you to recoup those fees as kind of services in some other form if you if you don't end up needing it. And it might be that depending on what your business model is, how big you are, that might be a more viable option because you'll get almost some guaranteed output from that pay that that regular payment that you make if you can claim it back if you don't use your IR services if you can claim it back for penetration testing or or kind of cyber security reviews you might end up getting more value out of the money than if you were to just spend it on insurance and never need it yeah and i think that's a really good point because obviously you know people are finding it very difficult to see um you know where the the, the true value of spend is at the moment you know with uh, everything kind of a bit disrupted by sort of COVID changing, you know, organisations to push them towards digital transformation and, and looking in, in spaces like the cloud. It's it's difficult to be able to advise them what, what is truly best. You know, is it better return on investment to invest in some controls that would prevent those things from happening? Or, you know, indeed, would it be better to look at, at, at an insurance policy that, that might cover you? Um, Duncan's just asked a question around um, quantifying cyber risk. That's a really, really good point. Um, FAIR is around, um, you know, a lot now within organisations. Um, and I think the, the thing that we tend to see is that mapping between qualitative and, and quantitative risk management. You know, it's very easy at an operational level to decide potentially whether something is, is high, medium or low. Um, it's less easy to see as that gets escalated and, and as the kind of... Um, you know, as the potential impact of that gets greater, as it goes up the risk chain um, to a more strategic risk, I think organisations are using quantified risk approaches now, such as FAIR, to actually try and understand what the true value of that risk is. Um, but I think, as, as Aaron's just been saying, it, I think it's quite difficult to be able to quantify the potential impact or cost of uh, something like, like that scenario, um, because you, you're, you're kind of planning for the unknown to some degree. But the, the answer to your question is yes. You know, we see organisations using um, FAIR and, and various other quantified methodologies now um, at, at probably more a tactical and strategic level, trying to gain you know, a greater understanding really of, of what, the, what the risk means to them as an organisation. Um, and, and that's you know, a really good way of informing whether cyber, uh, cyber insurance is going to cover that gap or not. Um, you know, and, and I think having a mature approach to understanding what the you know, level of cyber resilience is and, and then what the gaps might be you know, through a quantified approach would give you a really good standing when you come to looking at insurance and you know, whether that's the right thing to do. But equally, as, as Aaron just said, you know, it's, it's probably also about what the potential impact is against um, you know, using other controls or technologies to help actually prevent those things from happening in the first place. But it's interesting because I think quantified risk is a lot more difficult to, to work at in, in a cyber um, type of environment. It is a little bit more subjective, which is why a lot of organisations use kind of qualitative approaches. But yeah, really interesting question. Thanks for that. Um, I guess thinking then along that same lines, you know, you mentioned earlier around the insider threat, Aaron, I guess 
you know, looking at threats from third parties, you know, we're, we're always talking to clients about threats from third parties and, and being able to tie those into the organization's risk uh, methodology and risk approach. But how, how do we deal with insiders? You know, we've talked a little bit before about sort of zero trust models and, you know, things like that. But where, where does that really leave us when we're when we're talking about um, insiders? So I think the insider threat is something that will never go away because users have to have access to things to be able to do their job for the business to function. Um, and there's always a risk that someone will do something that they either do by accident. These things do happen. Um, you could have your equivalent of dropping coffee, but you accidentally drop all the tables in the SQL database and the impact is, is potentially much, much higher. Um, so in terms of dealing with it, it's, it's a challenge, obviously, um, with kind of user monitoring with, that comes with things like EDR, understanding what, what users actually do in their day-to-day -day basis and, and kind of blocking when things are, are kind of out of step with the expected norm is obviously great, but requires fairly significant investment in obviously the EDR products and then tailoring them to actually accurately reflect what's, what's used in your network. Um, and then obviously there's, you have the kind of baseline control of making sure that you're enforcing least privilege across, across the whole network, make sure that everybody doesn't have access to the whole file share that everybody uses. And you have those kind of gates in place that, that limit the potential damage, even if somebody accidentally does something that they can't kind of cause business wide impact. Uh, again, you have the issue of there's always going to be administrators. There's always going to be this attack vector. Um, and also, is it something you can insure against? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point. Um, you know, insiders, you, you know, you, you pointed out the kind of two sides to it, really, or, or three, I guess, if you include privileged users. But you've got the kind of malicious and the non-malicious, which is the, the two that you're looking at most often, I guess, within an organisation. But you, you treat them very differently, don't you? Obviously, when you employ people, you have that level of trust that they're, you know, invested in the business interests and, and they're obviously operating with conduct that is, you know, commensurate with what's expected by the business. But, you know, dealing with non-malicious, you know, the, the, the kind of Homer dolt kind of moments, um, you know, I think you treat those very differently, don't you, to, to the malicious ones, which, you know, incidentally, I, I think, you know, when, when we're out talking to clients, actually, they're not coming from privileged users. Those are coming from, you know, either disgruntled employees or people where they've got, you know, potentially a change of role. I, I can think of a couple of examples where, you know, users have changed roles internally, they've retained levels of access that they didn't necessarily need. And, you know, that's, that's sort of got lost in the, in the translation from sort of one job into another job, which, you know, when they do, you know, potentially leave, um, you know, they, they've got access to things that, that they shouldn't have, which, which obviously leaves the potential uh, you know, attack vectors that that slight bit wider. So, I mean, how do we protect against insider threats? And you know, maybe think about the non-malicious ones first. I mean, what 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 do we put? You mentioned endpoint detection and response. You know, how how would that help us understand more about the uh, you know day to day of a of a, of a non-malicious user? So, with heuristics that come with a lot of EDR, you're you're obviously mapping what what is standard and what is the baseline. So you have obviously a detective point where users step outside that baseline. If users are kind of connecting to devices they'd never normally connect to, uh, for example, if they normally test everything in a, in a development environment and don't do anything with production and, and one day they accidentally log into a production and by some kind of wider scenario, their credentials are the same. They're, they're not a user that's aware that they should have separate credentials for those. And then they do something that they thought would happen in production in, in the development environment and it happens in production. There's a possibility that you can kind of interact and stop that connection before they even get as far as connecting to the system that they don't normally connect to. Obviously, the, the kind of lowering privileges as a whole is a challenge. Ma maintaining privileges, joiners, movers, leavers, all of those present huge issues for, for organizations, especially as you get larger it becomes much more difficult to ensure that users have only the permissions that are actually required for their role. So that, that strikes me very much about protecting the users rather than sort of protecting the, the company, which I guess if we look at um, kind of malicious insiders, you know, we're, we're thinking there about how we 
how we reduce the impact or, or reduce the you know surface of, of what they could potentially affect so I guess we're we're thinking about that differently though aren't we we're protecting it maybe EDR there is is not necessarily about protecting the user at this point it's about learning behaviors and then you know how, how do we then use those behaviors to, to fine-tune controls? I mean, we talk a lot about um, privilege access management solutions. You know, there's a lot of them out there now. And, you know, we've talked before in, in our sessions around sort of cloud profiles and zero trust, as I mentioned earlier. You know, how, how do we use that information from technologies like EDR to actually help us understand what controls we need to have in place to, to protect ourselves from malicious insiders? So essentially, the, the EDR provides this kind of opportunity to get a mass of data about, about end users to understand what they do and how they're doing it. And then you can use that information to then go about implementing or acquiring other products that kind of enforce those standard use cases. So things like PAM solutions are great. You can make sure that users' passwords are only valid for a much shorter period of time. So even if a user loses their password, it's no longer valid because it's only a that password was set as a random string for, for the privilege account. It's set for a random string. It's valid for six hours or however long is required to kind of perform the action, at which point it, it, it kind of cuts off, which removes this kind of opportunity to, to break outside of that kind of known standard use cases. So by implementing these additional controls, you can kind of make sure people don't leave that standard kind of pattern of work. Um, I guess probably good to, to draw in the example that I mentioned of the news article at the start. Um, essentially, uh, an individual was fired um, from a Florida company. And in the couple of hours between being fired and being escorted out of the building, uh, their colleagues basically reported afterwards that they saw them sat at their com computer repeatedly pressing the delete key. Um, and what they'd done was delete masses of a company internal files, CVs of applicants, um, everything and anything they could reach, they were kind of actively deleting it um, and ultimately ended up costing the company about $100,000 to $200,000 to remediate and recover as many of the documents as possible. But there's a reasonable portion of those that they couldn't recover just because of where they were deleted. They were deleted from file shares that didn't have kind of on host recycle bins and things like that. So there's, there's clearly huge fallout from those, the kind of the risk of somebody either doing something accidentally or doing it intentionally. Yeah, I think it's interesting there as well, because there, there's a people and process element that's failed there as much as anything else. You know, the order in which those things happen, you know, typically we'd see within, you know, joiners, movers, leavers processes that, that the um, you know, taking the access away typically happens before, uh, you know, any meetings with HR, which, you know, kind of helps to prevent that. So, you know, from a technology perspective, I guess they learned a lesson there around, you um, access controls and, and around sort of people management, but also around their processes, I imagine, and how those are performing as well. Um, you know, we've we've got a question around um, around EDR. So I'm, I'm just going to launch a poll quickly to give you a bit of time to answer. But I guess I'm interested in, in whether your organizations have, have suffered um, any type of cyber threat or, or maybe even yourselves, um, because, you know, I, I get things like phishing emails all the time. So I'm just going to launch that and, and leave that running for a minute. But um, we've got a question around EDR and the type of information that it collects. Um, you were talking a bit, Aaron, about, uh, and I don't know the ins and outs of EDR solutions, but um, on, on a basic principle, it would be looking at, you know, defining a set of what looks normal and then using the heuristics gathered from the endpoint to, to actually, you know, compare to that what looks normal profile and, and actually determine whether an activity is allowed or not. That a basic understanding but what type of data does it use to do that i mean the, the question i think is more around the awareness of that data and whether users need to be informed that, that that's happening you know i guess we do that through policy but what how, how does that work in principle so with the tuning stage uh, there's obviously data is gathered from kind of processes that are running how long apps are open for the kind of communications that those apps are doing they generally won't be tracking things like content of documents, the content of the communications, um, unless they're kind of clear text, but it's unlikely any kind of business level applications will be using clear text communications. Um, so whether or not users need to be aware, I think generally policies around business devices um, that will have the EDR installed in them will cover 
that kind of notification. Um, there'll be kind of policies in place with most, com most companies that if you're using a, a business device, there's, there's a reasonable possibility that you'll be kind of monitored in your usage to make sure that you're not doing anything that would bring the company into disrepute or, or cause a security issue. Once you've built that model, um, which obviously can take a fairly significant amount of time and needs to gather information from as many endpoints as possible so the model accurately represents a broad spectrum of users, generally the, the information gathered is, is much more kind of focused on the application trees that are being run and the, the way that those processes are running in memory. And generally it will be applied to a model um, and then that's kind of the, the limited use of the heuristic is mapping to the model locally rather than it being cached for a longer term. Separately to that, the EDR will also kind of centralize logs and from the from endpoint devices to a single place. Those logs will be kind of your standard logs that programs will make of your usage, as well as some kind of additional logs about how Windows internals essentially runs, how processes were spawned, the different trees by which those can be mapped to. Those are generally not user identifiable but are, are, are going to be aggregated on mass so that you can kind of have your central point of investigation, essentially. Um, and that allows the kind of technical teams to investigate that. So I guess the, the key points there is that it's not really looking for the data, it's looking for the activities and learning about how they fit into that profile um, and, and taking action based on that. So uh, it's interesting because I think, you know, we, we are living in a world now where we have um, sort of GDPR and we're looking at giving people more freedom around controlling what's tracked, what's not tracked. And, you know, those systems and solutions are there to help protect, you know, the individuals and the organization as, as we've talked about, but, you know, understanding how that data is being used and, and ultimately what it's being used for, I, I think is really important. Um, so just before we finish, I just want to have a little look at the poll. I mean, unsurprisingly, I think most people have Kind of talked a bit about phishing emails and, and social engineering. Um, I, I see those all the time. Um, interesting that a couple of people have also sort of talked about supply chain. Um, I think you know that's becoming more prevalent now in, in understanding how your supply chain risks um, you know affect your organization. And you know we looked a little bit earlier at the sort of shared responsibilities and, and actually how sort of not understanding that supply chain can can potentially impact um, the, the organization. Um, but I, I think that is a is kind of a fair representation of what I expected. Um, you know, I, I'm pleased that nobody's put I haven't experienced a cyber attack. Um, I always get caught out by these, but I, I think everybody in some capacity has, has experienced some level of cyber attack. And, you know, I think Aaron summed up really well how these things can affect organisations, but also how easy they are to uh, to potentially execute for um, you know, malicious or, or non-malicious third parties. So um, hopefully that was that was useful. Um, I certainly found that useful, um, understanding a bit more about uh, EDR and, and particularly, you know, those couple of examples that Aaron pulled out from, uh, from kind of what's been in the news recently. Um, please stay tuned for uh, our next session uh, next month. Um, but otherwise, I wish you a good evening. Um, thanks for attending um, and I hope you'll take care.